house of the Lord. So let us be glad this morning and just come with an open heart and just receive what the Lord has for us this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen.
Okay, guys, we know that there's some sound and audio issues this morning that they are working on diligently, so I'm going to make some announcements as Todd and Pastor are tracking those, uh, tracking those and fixing it. So while we're doing that, if you have not picked up a September calendar from the back on that back table, make sure you grab that and put it on your, front, your refrigerator so you know what the coming events are. Uh, Li Liberty, can I borrow you? Ladies. One event that's coming up is our Mom's Night Out on Friday, September 13th at 6. Bring five bucks for pizza, bring some drinks and snacks, and we're all going to have a wonderful time piled in at the parsonage. No kids. No kids. Mom's Night Out. And despite popular belief by some children, mom is not made of money. That is not the acronym. All right, some more announcements for you. This coming Saturday, guys, is the men's breakfast, 8.30. You want to make sure that you're there. Uh, do we have a menu? Surprise. So make sure that you're available and, and attending that. Our next Bible study is going to begin Tuesday, September 10th at 6.30. You can either come here down in the hall for Bible study, or you can get, a, if you are traveling home from work, there's a few people that tune in online as they're traveling or they use their computer at home. So if, whichever works for you. Also, ladies that are attending the fall conference, your hotel fees, which are $125, will be due no later than October 1st. All right. Our next Teams meeting is September 8th at 5. Paula is not here. I think she's helping at the fair this morning. But she wanted me to tell you that there is a singing group at the nursing home. It is every other Tuesday. I believe it's the first and third Tuesdays of the month. 
at 10 a.m. If you're interested in helping participate in that or helping with the morning service that she helps over there, please talk to her. Her phone number is on the bulletin board out in the lobby, and you can make sure you check in with her. They are always looking for volunteers for our precious people at the nursing home. So please make sure if that is something that you feel the Lord leading you to do, that you engage in that area. I am looking for pastor. <laughs> He's still tracking an issue. All right. There is going to be a, another home group study starting September the 15th. And this is going to happen the first and third Sunday nights of the month at 6 o'clock. So this is going to be viewing the chosen. Have, many of you have heard of this show. It's got several seasons, and some of you may not have access to it, but it's very good um, illustration of Jesus. And we want to open the door for people to attend. We are asking that if your children are under 12 or 13, you must be present. But we think that until you see it, perhaps young children should refrain because there is, if you know the, the history and the account of Jesus, we really should pay attention to what things will be shown and discussed in this. And it is important topics so you need to make sure your children are mature enough to view. So we would love to have you in attendance. It's going to be at the Parsonage, 6 o'clock. We'll watch an, a chosen there roughly at 45 to an hour long. And uh, we're going to have discussion afterwards. So that will go from roughly 6 to 8. So make sure that you put that on the calendar starting September 15th. And there he is. <laughs> Keep talking for a minute. Are you guys happy for this cooler weather? Let's pray. Let's take a moment. Uh, we're going to bless the offering, and we're also going to pray over this technical issue. How does that sound? Father, I thank you that we could be in your house this morning. God, I thank you that we have the privilege of being here, that you have a church just here in Lancaster for us. And this morning I ask that you take care of these audio, visual, sound, whatever it is, issues with the computer, that you would just fix it and let it run smoothly so our, our folks that are watching online can have a good service as well. Lord, I ask at this time that you would bless our tithes and our offerings and help them to go as far as possible with the ministries of this church we, we thank you for the giver and the gift. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm sure that you guys have heard it before. It says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. To walk humbly with God. I want to bring to you guys some important points, but let me give you guys a little bit of context before we jump right into this. Um, Micah of Moresheth, a uh, town su of southern Judah, Micah prophesied during the reign of uh, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah, around 750 to 8 686 B.C. All right, now the Historical context here is Israel, again, was in a tumultuous period in the northern kingdom. And, um, yeah, okay. Um, and there was this, is it working? Can you send a uh, link to, uh, like, send it on to your page, my page. Send it to Benji because he's saying it's gone. Benji, I got you um, once you find it. Anyway, um, so this was in a tumultuous time in the kingdom of Israel and facing a threat of a, a Syrian um, invasion, there was some problems. There was this social and religious climate that was difficult. Religious practices had become corrupt with many people following rituals and um, oppressing the poor. Religious practices um, were um, in the place of idolatry, had become prevalent despite the warnings of the prophets. And so Micah finds himself speaking these words, these difficult words, these challenging words. And these are the words that I want to talk to you about today because when we're in our series, Do Good, I want to talk to you about listening and responding. I'm going to talk to you about the three things um, specifically that this verse speaks about, okay? 
Number one is to act justly. And this is a call to action. This is a call to action. We need to learn how to listen and when to speak. We need to know when to listen or we need to learn how to listen and we need to know when to speak. I want to talk to you guys about social justice a bit this morning. We need to tune out the noise of the world, tune out the noise of distractions, tune out the noise of everything that's going on around you that is attempting to corrupt your view or thoughts on what it means to be just socially. I'll be real with you guys this morning. All right. It feels like doing good and social justice and all of that stuff has become trendy. It has become popular. Like I'm going to do good. I'm, I'm going to be socially um, aware and, and I'm going to step out there and be involved and do something. But there's, there's something that we need to allow to speak to us and we need to allow to encourage us and challenge us. We need to allow to make us or motivate us to do something. You see, in a world full of shouting, it's essential to discern which voices are truly speaking about real issues, about real problems, about what's really going on. And once we listen, once we hear those things, once those things come to our hearts and we begin to be affected by them, we need to do something about them. We need to respond. We need to know when to speak. And I know, I know this, okay? I know that we're living in a difficult time, and I understand, okay? I understand that, that it can be hard. We can feel overwhelmed. We can feel like, well, what do I do? What can I do? How can I respond? How can I do anything about the issues and the situations that are in front of us right now? What am I supposed to do? There are people, um, you know, Stepping out there bravely and making statements about inequality, making statements about racism, making statements about the flaws and the problems. There are people out there that are bravely doing that, but sometimes it can feel so overwhelming. What can I do? And to that, I want to just simply say one thing. We can all do one thing. We can all do one thing. It, let, me, let me tease this out for just a second. Simply... Being kind is one of the greatest opportunities to act justly. Simply being kind. Stand up for someone. Refuse favoritism. Refuse to laugh at jokes that aren't funny. Now, I know that sometimes, and I'll be, I'll be real, I'm going to wade carefully into this, but um, some of our culture has gotten kind of soft, and, and like things that are a little funny, that are okay to be funny, should be funny and not like offensive. But then there are some things that people say that really aren't funny, that they shouldn't say. Like, it's not about being soft. It's not about, you know, being, oh, you know, um, you're just too, <laughs> you know, you, you're just offended about everything. You know, some things we should be offended about. Some things we should speak up. Some things we should say, that's not okay. One of the greatest ways for us to do something, one of the greatest ways for us to respond, one of the greatest ways for us to do um, get involved is to simply be kind, to simply be compassionate, to, con to simply say something nice. Do you realize how many people are out there? It doesn't matter, okay? I mean, it does matter, but I'm talking about skin color. I'm talking about language barriers. I'm talking about economical barriers. I'm talking about where you are in this world. And there are so many people that feel so socially ousted. They just feel like they don't belong. They feel like they're not a part. They feel like they, they, they can't be respected or, or you know, and, and just your kindness. Saying something appropriate, saying something kind, saying something sensitive and polite, saying something that matters is important. And when people see that around you, when people see what's going on, when people see your life and they're like, wow. Something big is happening there. Something grand is happening there. Something great is happening there. They're saying what needs to be said. They're speaking about what needs to be spoken about. Because God has told us through Micah, the, this, this situation, it was bad. It was not good. And he's saying, look, act justly. This requires involvement. I mean no disrespect when I say this, but silence is the same as being complicit. And that's harsh. 
That's hard. That's difficult. That's challenging to say that, to say that, to say that not speaking up, not getting involved, not saying something, not responding is the same as it, it speaks. It's saying it doesn't matter to you. It's not important. It's not special. Like, I, I know it's gotten complicated, and I know that there is a massive mess out there about what opinions and what approaches. This isn't about political parties. This isn't about the right or left. This isn't about you versus them or them versus you. This is about people. And this is about Jesus calling us to love people. And this is about God calling us to do something, to act in some way, as uncomfortable as it may feel. We need to learn to listen. We need to learn to how to listen and when to speak. The second part of what he's speaking there is, is we need to love mercy. This is radical mercy in a world of chaos and hatred. I'm going to say it like this, because Micah was talking to his people in a place where they were being oppressed. Resentment, even for real enemies, and loving mercy cannot coexist. I can't. Like, we are in a time right now where people who feel... And very much, you know, I'm, I'm going to rephrase the word feel. People who are being oppressed. People who are facing criticism. People who are facing ridicule. People who are being pushed out because uh, of um, their nationality, because of their gender, because of their socioeconomic position, because of the amount of money they have, because of, of whatever setting or situation it is. It's so easy to resent people that hurt you. Like, how dare you say that about me? How dare you come across like that? How dare you speak those things? And then we can begin to feel this resentment well up within us, and it corrupts everything. You see, because we need to be forgiving. We need to act kindly. We need to practice patience. We need to do something. We need to... Love, mercy, this is sincere, this is pure, this is real. This is something that is born within. This is an affection, an appreciation, a, 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 a connection with the idea of mercy, no matter who it is. You may be the person who has been accused and ridiculed and pushed to limits I can't even begin to understand. And you know why I can't understand them. To places I can't even begin to understand. And it's so hard, but we are called to even for our very real enemies to love mercy, to be radical about it, to be, be real, to, to show others. Mercy isn't feeling pity or offering a single act of kindness. It's about living with a heart that overflows with compassion, a heart that overflows with kindness, a heart that overflows with forgiveness, no matter who the person is and what they've done. Mercy doesn't discriminate. It is abundant. It reaches everyone just as God's mercy flows through freely to us. Just as much as mercy flows to you, mercy flows to me. We need to allow that mercy to flow to others. It's not passive. It's active. It, is, it exists in kindness. It exists in forgiveness. It exists in patience. It exists in love. It is stepping in for the marginalized. It is stepping in for people who are struggling. Here's, here, and, and here's a hard truth. I'm just going to say it like it is. Loving mercy is even loving the ignorant and arrogant. Because there are a lot of people out there who are like very frustrated, rightfully so. Very angry about how things are. And they're just unaware. They, they don't understand fully. They're, they're confused. They're, um, they're ignorant. I, I, don't, I don't have any more... It's, I know that's not polite, but sometimes somebody says something and you're like, I want to punch you in the face. Let's just be real. I want to pull back and hit you and hit you really hard. And sometimes you got to step back and say, but is that loving mercy? 
And am I seeing the condition of this person? Am I seeing what they know and what they don't know? Am I seeing how they were raised? Am I seeing the, the decisions that were made for them? Am I seeing things clearly? Or am I making decisions and assumptions based on my feelings and my frustration? You, you guys see what I'm throwing down here? Like, we need to seriously, seriously love people that make us mad. I mean, we think of the parable of the Good Samaritan. I don't have time to go through it this morning, but the, the people of high prominence and high standing pass by, but there's this man who has been beaten and bloodied, left for dead. And an act of mercy not only brought him to an end, but paid for his care. Now, we can, we can act justly, we can love mercy, but we're asked to do it humbly. Micah wants us to walk humbly. This is a heart of sincerity. I don't know if you guys have ever been in a situation where someone is being kind, where someone is being compassionate, where somebody is stepping in to say something, and you're like, you're not being real. This isn't sincere. You, you know, like... Um, I don't, I don't feel like you're, you're really showing me the kind of, kind of love, the kind of acting in mercy and, or acting in justice and, and loving mercy. I don't, I don't feel like it's real. It, it doesn't feel sincere. It feels like uh, it's an expectation that you just have to do. Like, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm getting pressured on every side. People are going to have problems if I don't speak up, if I don't say something. And then you say something, and they're like, what is that? That's, that's gross. It's not real. It's not personal. It's not you doing something out of the sincere love that exists within you. Matthew twenty two thirty six 36 through 40. They're trying to trip him up. They're creating problems. They're asking Jesus what is the greatest of all commandments. And he makes this statement when he's asked. It says, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? All right. And Jesus replied. Now, if you look at the Ten Commandments, you'll see this. It's about God and others. If you look at the Ten Commandments and read through them, you will notice this over and over again through each commandment. You must love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself or love others. The entire law and all the demands of, um, of the prophets are based on these two commands. These two commands. Because, listen, humility is the foundation of genuine transformation. True change doesn't come from a showy gesture, but from a heart that seeks to serve others with love and, hum and humility of Christ, the humility of Christ. This is something that changes within a person, something that motivates them. Let's go back to that verse for just a minute, okay? In Matthew 22. And let's, let's begin to ask ourselves, like, how do the words of Micah ring clear in this? In verse 38. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love others as yourself. Love people, right? The Bible tells us to fir he, we first love because he loved us. There's things that we need to get involved in, things that we need to do, things that we need to respond to. I understand that it's, it's, it's messy out there. I understand that there are people who had good intentions and those good intentions went bad. I understand. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, that we're always going to get it right. We've seen where... where um, Marches and protests and walks and, and parades and all of that stuff have gone seriously awry. And it's not just here and now in these moments. It happened back in the civil rights moments. This is problematic. And it's not like, oh, well, it's the people who started it or the people who were parading or the people who were protesting. It's their fault. Or, or it's, it's the people who got involved and started pushing back. It's their fault. It's our fault. I'm sorry. This is our fault. This is our problem. Why do people have to do that? Because we are, we have an issue. Now, 
This is an unpopular truth, and I'm, I, I want to be careful when I say this, but we're all, we're all discriminate. We, we, we discriminate. We, we have our opinions. We have our ideas. We have our thoughts. We see somebody and see how they look, and we make immediate judgments about them. When, when, uh, when David, King David, before he was King David, was being anointed, his dad offered all of the other sons to Samuel. He's like, look at this guy, and look at this guy, and look at this guy. Look how wonderful and handsome and beautiful these are. And, and, and Samuel's like, not any of these guys, not these ones. I know they're, you know, they're the elite of your family, but not these ones. Where's the other one? Oh, he's, he's doing stuff with the sheep, which was the lowliest of low, and and that was David. He was the guy, and we were told in those scriptures that God looks inside, not outside. God looks at the heart, not the outward appearance, not what a person looks like. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God for that. <laughs> and because I had a kid that told me, as I get older, I'm going to look more and more like a troll. Anyway. You, I just heard a name, man. That's kind of messed up. Anyway. <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. How do we personally practice this, though? How do we practically act justly how do we get involved how do we step out there bravely and do something we all have an issue with this we all have a problem and we all need to step up and we all need to be the church we need to be who the church has called us to be we need to be who god says we are our reconciliation starts with God. We are to be people who reconcile others to ourselves, right? In Acts chapter 2, what does it tell us? That we are to be a church from all different tribe and nation and the tongue. That we all get to, to be together and beautiful things happen. But how do those things happen? Well, you need to begin to operate as Micah described. How can you expect someone to come in here and participate and be a part of our church if we aren't acting justly, if we aren't loving mercy, if we aren't walking humbly? And here's here's the beautiful thing, guys. I say, how do we expect? And sometimes we feel like, oh, no, you know, pastor's coming and he's swinging hard. I will say this. I am seeing in this church, in the movement here in northern New Hampshire, at Lancaster Assembly of God, this is being lived out. It's happening. It is happening. Like, I can understand other places where, that are closer to certain um, more busy and congested areas where people who are diverse gather, but way up here north, where we're seeing in our services more culture, more diversity, more opportunities to minister to people, that's beautiful. And we're participating in that. We're a part of that. I want it to continue. I want it to grow. I want it to move as we do good, not just because we feel like we're expected to or we feel like it's necessary or we have to or the culture is pushing us to it or, or the church is pushing us to it or we feel even the pressure from God. I want us to do it because we love Jesus, and this is what Jesus has called us to do, to love people who are not like us, to love people who are different than us, and this is big. I mean, it's everywhere. To love people who walk in here and smell funny. To live, love people who walk in here and, and don't have much. I still remember we were here like maybe three weeks. And there was a guy. He was, I mean, he was drunk. I mean, seriously drunk. And he was walking right out front here. And, and he saw the doors were open. He stupored his butt right in here and sat down. I mean, he smelled and he sounded funny because he had had too much. 
And I'll never forget it. I've never seen the guy again. I don't know where he is or what happened after that, but I'll never forget the love that was given to him here in this room, in this building. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. Like, like it was, it was it was wonderful how people treated him and how people cared for him and how people were affectionate to him and kind to him in his time of need. There are things that are happening and our decisions today will determine what side we land on. And I know that I said this isn't about sides, but whose side are we to be on We're not building a kingdom here. We're building a kingdom in heaven. We're not trying to get people over to our side or over to our opinion or over to our thoughts. We are to win people to Christ. We are to what? Capture every argument that stands against the truth and the knowledge of God. We're to capture them. We're to hold them. We're to to keep them from harming and watch as people respond. I'll say it over and over again. Our mission as a church is to rob hell of as many people as possible. That's what we're called to do. I want to do everything in my power to share Christ, to share who he is, to share his mercy and his love. It's messy out there, but we can get involved. We can step in. We can participate. I'll ask you some questions here at the end here. What is one specific action you can take this week to stand up against injustice? Remember what I said, okay? Everyone can do something. Everyone can do one thing. Everyone can do one thing. And I'm not telling you, like, oh, I'm going to get on my social media. I'm going to get on my, my Facebook or my Instagram or my blue sky or my threads or my, you know, TikTok or my, you know, on and on and on, right? Uh, there's so many different social media places. You know, like, don't, hey, I'm going to be socially just and then send a message out there that's just going to make everybody mad. Like, that's not what I'm saying. All right? That's not what I'm saying. Like, it might feel good at first, but in the end, everybody, it's, it's, it's not good. But we can take an action of some kind. We can love somebody. Don't make it awkward. Like, ooh, this person is different than me, so I'm going to go and show some overly awkward love. No, don't do that. That's just strange. That doesn't make you like that. Don't be that person that's just going up to people that are different than them and saying, hey, look, I'm loving someone that's not like me. There's something we can do, though. We can be kind. We can speak up. It might not be... It might not be the most... Um, like, you know, get together with the family and stuff or, or at a birthday party or, or um, you know, at a family gathering or, or whatever. You know, Thanksgiving's coming or something. And someone just shoots out there one of those, like, bad time, bad jokes. And just look at them like, uh uh-huh. That's not okay. That's not that's not that's not okay. But we saw, but at the same time, be strong when you need to be strong. So how can you show compassion to someone who is wrong you? And this is this is where I want to ask you to be brave when you've been wrong. I want you to do something difficult. When you feel marginalized and, and again I know this is hard for me to say this because I, I feel like things are a lot different for me. You know why. But how are you going to forgive someone who has hurt you or wounded you because of your status, because of your position, because of how much money you have or don't have, because of the color of your skin or the language you speak. Like when somebody has said awful things about you. And Mike is saying, love mercy, love mercy, love mercy, love mercy. How are you going to show compassion to someone who has acted like that and responded like that and treated you poorly? How 
can you ensure your kindness is done with a humble heart? I'll say it over and over again. You can either choose to be humble or be humble. Which is how it works. All right? The Bible tells us that in the last, every knee will bow. Yeah. You just got to choose when it's going to bow. All right. You can bow now or you can bow later. It's just that, it's that simple. We need to walk humbly. We need to be kind with a humble heart, with a heart that is sincere and a heart that is real, a heart that people are going to see and know that Jesus' love really exists within you, and they're going to notice that it's not just like a, a pressure to do something because culture is pressuring you to do something, or the church is pressuring you to do something. They're going to say, wow, look at what this person did. That's love. That's sincere. That's real. That's beautiful. They're humble.
But here we are. This is what you called us to do. This is who you called us to be. So Jesus, help us to live in the frame of the two greatest commandments, to love you, God, and to love people. That when we step out there bravely, that we would act justly, motivate us, convict us, push us. Help us to love mercy. Help us to be humble about it all. <clears throat> I thank you for the work that you've done here and the work that you're continuing to do. Help us to be a bright and brilliant, shining light in this world. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.